One of the features I have lacked on my 286 system and really wish I had is the ability to update the flash ROMs without having to actually physically pull the flash ROMs and put them into a programmer. So I am hoping to get functionality to be able to program them in the system. And maybe even at some point that means I could go without the ZIF sockets and just have them in a regular socket or even soldered in and have confidence that I can update them without needing to pull them. I've not done this before, so I thought I would ask those that maybe have had experience with this how this is often approached. And so I went out to Reddit and in the homebrew computer sub posted a question about, you know, how, how might someone approach this? And as always, I quickly received back all kinds of great ideas. I'm always impressed with how quickly people jump on questions there and come back with a lot of good ideas. So thank you to everybody uh, that's uh, helped chip into the thought process here. Uh, and, and all that feedback came back really quickly within half a day. And I'm sure there'll be more commentary there, but from my takeaways and kind of just thinking about this and my, my system and the constraints of my current system, I thought I would share maybe how I'm thinking about it right now as far as how might I get the support to update these flash chips while they're in the board. Maybe the first, yeah. I'll maybe call it a constraint that I'm working within, is I wanted to find a solution that wasn't going to require any major updates to my board. For now, I'm not doing anything that would require a secondary set of flash memory or adding an SPI flash, which I think would be a great thing to do on this. I have this pair of flash chips down here that are these microchip SST39SF010s. And I want to continue to work with those. So kind of wondering, you know, what could I do here to, to support this without maybe more than, you know, half a dozen or a dozen bodge wires or trace cuts or something like that. Well, I think what I'm looking at doing here is from my 286, while it's running, have functionality in the ROMs for the 286 that lets me update the ROMs. You know, so, so step one is probably to let the user somehow request to update the ROMs. And maybe there's a function key that pulls up a utility menu, and that utility menu has an option to you know, fetch the latest ROMs and program them. Of course, I'd confirm with the user, and if they say, well, yeah, let's continue, then what I might do is go fetch the latest ROMs from my PC. And so I have a development PC that's you know, typically connected to this Arduino Nano through a USB cable. So I can do serial communications, you know, between this Nano here and this PC here. And it's pretty easy for me to have a little host process that's running on that PC that when it receives a certain request from the Nano, it can now feed back, you know, byte by byte, all of the ROM data to the Nano. So that part, I, I'm not too worried about that stuff. I've done similar things and it hasn't been... Uh, too big of a deal. So I, th I, I have some confidence in doing that. As I look at this though, other things that I need to consider doing here is step one within this three, so 3A, you know, copy the update routine from ROM to RAM. So in my ROMs, I'm going to have to have some code that can do this communication to the nano, pull back information from the PC, and then update the flash. So I need to take that functionality and get it out of Flash because I can't be programming the Flash and reading the code or executing code from it simultaneously. But I, what I should be able to do is though take those routines for updating the Flash memory and copy them to RAM. And once they're in RAM, I can execute them from RAM. I think there'll, there'll be some challenges there for me to figure out how to do that and make sure all my memory offsets and all of that stuff works correctly. But I think it's, it's doable. It'll be a, a good exercise for me. But from my RAM now, I, I have the routines in memory that I can actually update the ROMs. And so then I'll make the call to the Nano through SPI. I'll then go fetch the data. I'll bring it back. And then I'll write it out to these ROMs. Before I actually do that writing of data to the ROMs, 
I have to disable my interrupts. So just to make sure that something in my system doesn't interrupt this update routine. So I'll disable interrupts so there's no keyboard, mouse, timers, things like that. In my PSOC, I am going to have a register and I'm going to call it an enable ROM write. And that register has to be flipped before I can write to these. And I'll give you a little bit more detail about that here momentarily. So the 286 is going to have to copy procedures up to RAM. It's going to have to disable interrupts. It's going to have to toggle our register in my PSOC. And then it can bring down the data and write it to the flash memory. And then at the end of that, either reread the entire you know, image and compare, make sure it all came down properly, or do some sort of a checksum comparison. I should state that you know these chips that I'm using for my flash do have built in software data protection. So even if the write enable signal goes low, which means enable writing, they're not going to allow writing without some extra few bytes of special data being sent to them to actually allow full writes. So that means that this register in my PSOC probably isn't overly necessary, but what it might give me in the future is I could then have portions of these ROMs, this flash memory that is not writable. So in my PSOC, I can control if there's maybe a special section of the ROM that no matter what, I don't want to allow it to be overwritten. I can go ahead and keep that write enable signal high, even though maybe some other code is trying to write to it or do something with it. So this, this extra register is just going to give, maybe give me some flexibility, maybe a little extra safety, but I would argue that safety just in general isn't needed. But if I want to get into read-only portions of the flash memory, then this register I think is going to come in handy. Now if I've done all of this, I've copied the routine from ROM to RAM, I've disabled my interrupts, I've toggled this write enable register in the PSOC, I then actually copy all the data from the PC to the nano to the flash memory. And then I validate that it came down correctly with, let's say, a checksum. Then probably the next step is to actually reset the system. And I'm going to put in support for that so that I can actually, from my nano, reset the system. And I'll show that a little bit more about that here uh, momentarily also. So if I go look at this PSOC for a second and just talk about the register that I've put in. I have put in a register here in the center of the screen. And all of these others are previous ones I've shown where I have an IO address for, for example, in this case, my interrupt controller, my math coprocessor for my programmable peripheral interfaces for my versatile interface adapter. I put in some comments about what uh, what specific address is being used for my VGA register and my sound card register. But now I'm adding one more and it's a 40, hex 40 will be the address for a register that is actually in the PSOC. All these other ones are just simply decoding to get to the registers elsewhere in the system. In this case, this register is in the PSOC itself. So I'm using a D flip flop with enable right here. And I'm checking to make sure that it's the proper I.O. address and I'm doing an I.O. write. So if I try to do an I.O. write to the proper address, that'll get me to this flip-flop. And then I'm going to read in my data zero line and write that in, which will now come out of that flip-flop. And I'm going to use the peripheral clock off of my clock generator chip for clock coming into this. So now I'm fetching those extra signals coming in. Uh, which really the, the extra signals I had to add would be my data line, this IO write signal, because I wasn't using that before, and also this peripheral clock. So those three lines coming in, but now I'm going to have an additional line coming out, which is a ROM write enable. And again, any of these that, uh, you know, like ROM write enable B is for bar, in other words, it's an active low. And at the same time, I'm going to use the onboard LED on the PSOC just to indicate the status of this signal. So if this LED is off, it's not writing because that would be a low here, which would not get me my NAND gate output that I would need. But if I do enable, I write in a 1 to this enable ROM write, 
that'll turn on the LED, that'll flip this to true. So if I'm also doing my memory right, and I am having this register set with a high, in other words, I've enabled with a high, so let's think of it as an active high, and I'm in 18, A18, A19 are both one, which this is the top 256K of my meg, then that will enable this as a low active low ROM write. And I can then enable both, both chips as far as the ROM write is concerned. And then I'll have some work probably to do to make sure that I can enable both chips because I want to want to write two bytes at a time or 16-bit writes and be updating both of those chips simultaneously. But I think I can work through that. So I have a little bit more thought to put into that. But I think I can make that work. Or I can write to one, then write to the other, get both of them into the proper write mode, and then burn through the entire addre address space of the ROMs and flash them. So hopefully that makes sense what I'm doing here. I've got a register, I need to come in, I need to flip it. If I flip it, that then will allow me to write to the ROM if I'm also doing a memory write at the address that is my proper address space for my ROMs. Now if I jump over to my 286 schematic, part of it has this messy thing on it, but this is just the schematic for my PSOC from the 286 perspective. And I just put little green dots just to call out here I'm going to pull in this IO write signal. I'm going to pull in the P clock. I'm going to pull in my uh, data zero. And then I'm going to output this ROM write enable. Something else while I'm here, previously if you look at my schematics, I was using all of these lines here for LED status output lines. I haven't been using those LED status output lines, so I'm just going to repurpose them. But I think what I am going to do on my next revision of my board is have a shift out capability so that I can use an internal uh, shift type of functionality and basically shift out all the values of as really however many lines I want to shift out as far as LED status indicators. So it'll require maybe an extra IC or two on my 286 board, but now I can free up a whole bunch of pins and use a shift register internally within this to shift out my LED statuses and then use a shift register to receive those in on the board and then light up appropriate LEDs. So that's probably a minor tweak I'll also make in a future version. Now, as far as these pins and connecting them, you know, all of these pins you're seeing here are right here on the PSOC. And all those LEDs I did already have routed up to this header up here. So I'm going to be able to jump into this header or this header to get to all of this. I also have my data line already, data and address lines already up in these pin headers. So I can easily now just pull data zero and just do a jumper over here. And so now I can get my data data zero in that I'll need. So all that's going to be pretty easy to connect up uh, the way this board is already laid out. To maybe jump into that in a little bit more detail. So I've got bus data zero that I'm going to pull and connect up. I'm going to have my P clock that I'll have to come off of my clock generator up to a pin on my P sock. So I'll have to put a bodge wire probably on the bottom side of that is, is probably where I'll mount that the bottom side of the system board. I'm going to have to cut the grounds off of these sockets. So and I shouldn't say off the sockets. I need to look and figure out, uh, can I simply, and I'm hoping I can, but uh, trim out the connection to the ZIF socket. Previously, my right enables on these chips were being pulled up to VCC, and I will have to cut those traces if I can. So I'm going to have to get in here and see if I can manage that or not. If I can't, that's going to make this difficult. And I'll have to probably wait till I revise the board, print an updated version. But I need to get this right enable signal. And again, this header is connected down here. So I'm really getting that ROM right enable down to these appropriate chips. So I'll have to do that. And then I also have my Arduino that's going to tap in over to this DS1232 and be able to trigger a reset of the entire system. Uh, so not just a reset of the processor, but a reset of the entire system and all of the peripherals that uh, drive off of this reset signal, which goes through my bus controller out to the rest of the system, or actually the clock gener generator has the reset in it. 
that is the master reset for everything. Uh, now, if I look at the coding I'm going to have to do to actually update these flash chips, those flash chips have these modes of operation. And if I'm going to go out and, for example, and do a, a program or an erase, um, I can I can come in here and basically make sure I flip the mode and pull my output enable high and get my write enable pulled low so I can program it, I can erase it. Uh, those are things that I can do there. And then there are these certain sequences that I can send it if I want to just byte by byte update the contents. If I want to erase a sector, which is a 4K amount of space, 4 kilobytes, or I can erase the entire chip. So probably what I'll do is I'll do a full chip erase and then I'll go through and program in the bytes that don't have FF in the byte already. The data sheet for this gives all of these sequences. So if I want to do an erase, here's basically the sequence I'll have to go through to do an erase. If I want to erase just a sector, I can do that. I'm guessing what I'll most commonly do is though is erase the entire chips and then write uh, all of the non-F data back to the chip, but we'll see how that goes. And so that is my plan at this point. So I think the only thing that might slow me down is if I'm not able to isolate the write enable pins. And maybe what I could do real quick is just take a look at that. Okay, so here I am in my 286 build. And I'm going to just come down to these. Here's one of these chips here. And let me go find my, yeah, here's my write enable. So this is showing, unfortunately, it's on the top layer for me to disconnect this. So if I am going to be successful here, I'm going to have to come in and take out the entire ZIF socket and cut this VCC. Um, on the bottom layer, I've got this signal, so that's out of the way, but my top layer is pulling up my right enable. And so being that that VCC is connected right here, that's going to be underneath the ZIF socket. So I'm going to have to pull out the entire ZIF socket, trim that. And once that is trimmed, that looks like that's actually going to disconnect this VCC from what's up here, um, which means I'll have to just make sure that there is redundancy that power is getting. I might have to connect this pin down here to this up here, but I'll have to look at that. But this is what I need to isolate is this pin here. So I need to get this off and this off of here and then connect this to an output of that PSOC. And if I go over to my other SST, same type of thing looks like it's going to apply here. So I have VCC on the bottom layer that I'm going to have to trim that. And then I have VCC on the top that I'm going to have to trim that. So I'm going to have to trim in both of these in between two pads along with this other connection and then probably take this up here and run a bodge wire if this line doesn't already connect from both sides. So if I look at my power here real quick, I can kind of see where that's all going. And actually with my copper fill, I don't think that's that one's going to be fine if I come up to the other side of this. Basically, that's just going to this cap, which is going to another cap. So really, I just have to make sure I get these caps connected back in down here. So that's not a big deal at all. And if I come look over here, let's see if that's the same situation. Um, now, in this case, it looks like that VCC continues. And let me just see here. So I see multiple points where it's getting connected. So what I, I think I'll be fine by just simply slicing this here and here. And then I'll double check that up here and down here still are fully connected to VCC, but I'm pretty sure they, they likely are. And if not, then again, I'll just have to run a little bodge wire that connects the appropriate points around this pin no longer being there. But I'll get these pins then connected to each other, connected up to my PSOC, one of these pins here or this header up here, and then I should be good to go. Uh, and luckily I have a desoldering gun that makes pulling these out uh, not as painful as it otherwise could be. So that's probably what I need to do is pull these, isolate a pin, connect 
these two and then get connected up to my PSOC. Okay, that is my plan. And I think, I hope that covers the physical aspect of it. And then I'll have to get in and figure out a whole lot of the software or the assembly aspect of it. You know, copying ROM to RAM, uh, running a procedure from RAM, uh, reading the information from the Arduino to the Nano to the 286, writing it, validating it, uh, and then calling a reset. I think that should all be a software challenge and or firmware software challenge and not a hardware challenge if the rest of this is making sense. So that's my plan. If anybody sees something here that at least as far as the hardware approach, you think I'm uh, missing something or should consider something, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll probably work on making these physical changes testing my machine, make sure it still works after those physical changes. And then I can start working on writing to the register, reading the data, updating ROM. And I can probably start with some safety type of tests where I just write to part of ROM that I know is not being used for my program. Make sure I can pull down, write to that space, read it back out of that space of the flash memory. So I think I can progressively test this without being too destructive. And the nice thing is, even if I completely screw up these flash ICs, I can always pop them out of their ZIF, put them into the programmer, and reprogram them accordingly. So I don't have a lot of risk there. And I'm hoping, I don't think I can actually physically damage these chips, but it wouldn't surprise me if I find some way to uh, break them. But I, I think that is probably a stretch to actually cause damage to these chips if I do something incorrect here. Uh, so feedback, uh, always appreciated. Thanks for everybody for uh, watching and for giving input as I go through this. And I will maybe post some updates if I can get some of this uh, working, uh, at least uh, to, the, to the point of updating my flash from my PC. As I was rendering the video that you just finished watching up to this point, I went in and started actually pulling out my ZIF sockets. And one of the things I did not take into account when I recorded that clip just a bit ago, when I was talking about these signals, this uh, basically VCC coming into this write enable of the flash, you know, I mentioned I was going to cut here, cut here. Uh, well, what I forgot that I wasn't showing on this view is to actually come in here and make the copper area visible. So I've got these copper areas, but you're not seeing it right now. So what I need to do is come in here and basically tell it to show the copper area. And there's this invisible, I'm going to set it to visible. And that maybe changes the perspective a little bit. So once I get into this, I can see that because of the copper fill, this pin is connected right to that copper fill. So the chances of me being able to trim this out properly on the top here where I've got this VCC is kind of slim to none. So given that, what I've then done is what you see here. I cut off those pins on both of the ZIF sockets. And when I say cut them off, basically I cut them flush to the plastic casing there. I then melted the plastic down a little bit with my soldering iron, soldered on an enamel coated wire, and put just a drop of hot glue on top of that just to insulate it so it doesn't touch the pad on the PCB when I put it back into the PCB. I did that to both of the ZIF sockets and then reassembled. And when I reassembled, of course, I ohmed out everything, just made sure that I didn't have any shorts that I didn't want to have. And I also made sure that that specific pin was coming through the way I wanted it to. I also connected the other lines that I mentioned earlier in the video and, and basically I've tested out the system. Everything is working fine at this point as far as the current system and how it has been working. So I haven't broken anything in the process, uh, but I now do have the... PSOC updated with what I showed earlier. And now that PSOC uh, has that logic that I can start to enable these writes to the ROM. 
And that might be the next test I do is just a quick code update to say, can I write to the register to enable the, the writes to the ROM? In other words, can I update the register that allows me writing to the ROM and then write to some, what I know is safe space in the ROM, some whatever string data, and then try to read that string data back out. And that might be just a good test to, to see even before I get to calling the nano and data from my PC, can I just simply write and read back portions of ROM data? And I think I should be able to do that, but I'm not going to guarantee that until I test it. So that is what I'm going to do next is to try to do a little assembly work just to do some fundamental testing of writing bytes to these ROMs.